Okay, I think we'll begin. Um, hello, everyone, uh, wherever you are in the world. Um, welcome to uh, this Catalyst 2030 fireside chat. Um, and today, um, I'll be talking with Professor Klaus Schwab and Hilde Schwab, um, who have really been tremendous friends to the social entrepreneurship movement over the years. Um, I think the first time I really ever met uh, a large group of social entrepreneurs was at a Schwab Foundation uh, event um, probably nearly two decades ago now and uh, I think social entrepreneurs were welcome at the World Economic Forum annual meeting in Davos uh, way before any other organization I can think of uh, probably even knew the term social entrepreneur so um, they really are uh, have been extraordinary supporters of this movement over the years and we're looking forward to talking with both of them uh, this morning about the work they're doing through the Schwab Foundation and also about um, this particular moment in time, um, which uh, Professor Schwab has, has given the, the, the name the Great Reset uh, because of the opportunity uh, it represents to really get the world back on track after this terrible pandemic and so many of the other crises that have been associated with it. Um, and we'll be um, as a group, Catalyst 2030 was really founded to focus on achieving this kind of systemic change needed to get to the Sustainable Development Goals. And the report that uh, I helped put together with so many of you um, that came out earlier this summer, um, getting from crisis to the global goals, uh, was really in the same spirit of how do social entrepreneurs play, a, play the role they should be playing in helping to make that great reset happen. So that will be a topic that we'll, we'll come on to later in this conversation. But before um, I turn to Professor Schwab and, and Hilda Schwab, um, I'm gonna ask Jeru Villamoria, who I think I met at that same event nearly two decades ago uh, that, uh, uh, with, with Hilda um, and Klaus, that uh, Jeru really has been the driving force behind Catalyst 2030, bringing so many of us together and uh, helping us uh, navigate um, the, the rather sort of precarious path to, to sort of coming up with a, a common way forward. So, Jeru, I would like uh, to ask you, first of all, uh, to, to welcome Klaus and Hilda and uh, set out the terms of, of engagement for this morning's conversation. Thank you very much, Matthew. Thank you, Professor Klaus Schwab and Hilda. Uh, I think, like you said, I was the first batch of social entrepreneurs and you all gave us the space. And I have to say, I, at that time I wasn't married, but when I did get married, I told my husband, we should be like Klaus and Hilda, see how supportive and close they are to each other. And that's something which has always been there. So you're a role model personally and also have been amazing supports professionally. It was in 2001 that you all gave the award and that time I was still living in India and was taking Childline to scale. And I remember you had come for the CII summit, uh, the World Economic Forum summit, which is done. And you went to visit our session, uh, our center, the Childline Center with street children. And I'm sure you don't remember, but I had a very angry web team because you were to be there for 10 minutes, Professor Schwab, and you stayed for an hour. And that interest, which was there, is something which I always remember because it is the street kid said, Bohat acha uncle hai. that means really nice uncle. And that's what they remembered about you. And I think that characterizes how as a social entrepreneur, I also look at how you have been, which is someone really kind to the movement and supporting us from behind. And that is where you have played a really key role. And what through, where after your visit, we were able to get the government to give a much larger grant to Childline, so we were able to scale. And you may not remember, but you wrote a letter to ITU, and that helped us to scale helplines across the world. So you've played, a, and I can fast forward that, you, you've played an important role. Hilda, what nobody knows is you are the secret force behind Catalyst. Because when I met you and Klaus in November, we met for a brief meeting because you gave such a sweet message for CYFI when we shut down and I really wanted to come and thank you all. And then we started talking about Catalyst 
And I remember it was a short conversation and then Gordon Brown was coming, so we moved out, but Hilda took us to the site and she said, let me know more about Catalyst. And then she spent a long time learning about Catalyst and we launched at Davos. Everybody knows that, but what everyone doesn't know is that the idea for that came from Hilda. She was the one who said, why don't you leverage that? Why don't you make it something which can happen? And I say this because many people know you as this couple up there, the power couple, which you all are. But I also know you, like many entrepreneurs, as the personal couple who've really always been there supporting us as social entrepreneurs. And for Catalyst, you all have done so much. Not only was there the launch, which, is the, which you have made happen, the Schwab Foundation has linked Catalyst to multiple stakeholders. We are also the strategic partners in the COVID Alliance, which you all launched at the foundation. And uh, well, I think I can go on and on, but I would like to take this opportunity to thank both of you, to give a special thanks to Francois, to Pavitra, to the whole Schwab team, which also supports, but mainly, Love you guys and thanks a million for doing this and being there and let's brainstorm how we can work and collaborate in the Great Reset also. Thanks a million. Sorry it's a bit personal but you all really are something. Can we give a big hand to Klaus and Hilda? All of us. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Over to you Matthew. Sorry. Great. Well thank you Jeru and uh, just just uh, briefly on how this, one, how this conversation will go. Um, we're going to have a conversation, the three of us, for probably 25 minutes to half an hour. Um, and then um, I'll turn to questions. We would ask that questions be submitted through the chat uh, function at the bottom of the uh, screen. And I will pick questions as they come in. And I'll try and be as, uh, you know, as broad as I can in terms of selecting the questions so we get a really good uh, flavor of what, what's on people's minds. Um, I wanted to start. Um, uh, actually, with, with Hilda, and just ask because because Jeru mentions um, you know the, the encouragement that you gave to Catalyst 2030, but also I think um, so many social entrepreneurs who've been in the Schwab Foundation have found your you know your quiet words of encouragement extremely helpful. And I just thought it'd be useful before we turn to these huge challenges of the Great Reset to get a sense from you as to um, you know, how you got started on the foundation and, and where the foundation. You know, is heading at the moment. What where you see your priorities? Thank you, Matthew, and um, thank you, Chiru. Thank you. T too much, too much, <laughs> because you were really the, you are the driving force. But I, I must say, when uh, you talked to me about the catalyst and about what you were aspiring to, I thought it was a fabulous idea um, because we need this kind of collaboration very much. So, and we will hear more about it. And uh, to Matthew, um, congratulations for the report. I really went through it uh, during the weekend and I was uh, amazed about uh, the depths of the report and all the questions you asked and really fantastic. Um, about the Schwab Foundation, I mean, I see so many friends on the, on the screen here. You, you all know, you have heard that before, um, but uh, just quickly for the ones who don't know us uh, well, um, uh, we created the Schwab Foundation in uh, about more than 20 years ago and the, um, the, the history behind was it was that I thought we should include uh, into the World Economic Forum's um, uh, decision makers group. We should include people who work on the ground and who are, and who are uh, really um, occupied in our daily lives uh, to make uh, the life of the people on the ground uh, better. Uh, to, to eradicate poverty and to, um, you know, improve healthcare and so on, and to give them a platform at the table of the World Economic Forum. And that's how it, it, it came, that uh, we had started to um, organize an award selection. Uh, we had every year about 20 awardees or more. Um, uh, people from all over the world, we made due diligence, uh, who would, um, answer the questions, um, uh, the selected, the uh, criteria we had set up. Uh, at that time, it was innovation, financial, financial sustainability, and so on. And so that's how it, you came all to this network. But in the meantime, of course, we, 
uh, we are still selecting um, about 20 of our Ds, uh, and the group must be diverse, inclusive, and representative. Uh, we think that the mindset, the mission, and practices of social entrepreneurs, of social innovation, are vital in all organizations, and they must penetrate society and should become incorporated in all aspects of life. And that's why we have extended uh, our community by integrated three, integrating three more categories of social entrepreneurs, meaning corporate intra corporate social intrapreneurs who are leaders inside a company like Harald Nusser, who I see here, who are inside a company that address societal and environmental challenges. And another category, the second one will be public social entrepreneurs, government leaders or leaders in international organizations. And uh, the third category we uh, included are social innovation thought leaders who are experts and acad academics recognized and respected. And this is, uh, so we have this year, of course, we have um, uh, again, 20 social awardees that we have selected and we will um, um, present them uh, during the uh, Sustainable Development uh, Impact Summit of the World Economic Forum on the 22nd of September. Virtually, of course, like everything has to be virtual now this year. <laughs> Thank you very much, Hilda. And I, I think that move to the corporate entrepreneurship as well, that, that new angle in particular is so vital at, at this mm -hmm. time when so many, we're, we're asking much more of companies than have ever been asked before. And, and often they, they haven't really championed that kind of leader uh, internally and they need to come to the fore. Klaus, I, Professor Schwab, I wanted to turn to you and uh, I suppose the first thought I have is that, you know, this really is a moment where, where your, your time has come. This has been your whole life has been focusing on private sector solutions to some of the big global challenges and particularly how the stakeholder capitalism needs to, to, be, to be at the forefront. Um, and yet there's this sort of tremendous urgency of this moment. And I, and I wonder, as you've, you've coined this phrase, the great reset, um, you know, why, you know, why you use that particular phrase um, and how uh, you feel things are going so far in trying to make the most of this, what could be, as you say, a narrow window of opportunity to, to, to reset the world. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew. And uh, it's such a pleasure to see uh, many familiar faces uh, here on the screen. Um, to respond uh, uh, to your question, um, when, when we look back at the annual meeting of the World Economic Forum in Davos this year, we had as a theme stakeholders for an inclusive and sustainable world, for a cohesive and sustainable world, which means um, we, we expressed already uh, the concern, and we did it over so many years already, that um, uh, our system, as we see it at the moment, is not fit for purpose, uh, fit for purpose to get higher ex inclusivity and to get higher sustainability, which we absolutely have uh, to, in we have to ensure a higher degree of uh, inclusiveness and a higher degree of sustainability. Otherwise, um, we will go into a, a vicious uh, circle. Um, now, the, the virus and the pandemic has brought to the fore how, um, how much there is a need uh, really to make this world more inclusive more sustainable, but I would add also more uh, resilient. I think this is a, an additional dimension uh, which we have to add. So um, time is running out. I mean, uh, I could give you so many examples of uh, what is wrong in the world. Um, I'm not believing in a complete systems change. I, I'm just coming out of, a, of an interview and um, People ask me whether um, 
uh, I'm arguing for systems change. No, I'm arguing for systems improvement because uh, for me, entrepreneurship is key. Uh, it's entrepreneurship which creates economic wealth and in such a way uh, creates um, social progress. But um, so uh, entrepreneurship has to be in the center, but entrepreneurship uh, has to be much more directed. And here, of course, the government comes in uh, towards um, what I said, a more resilient, more sustainable, uh, more cohesive world. And that's the reason why we feel that the system needs a reset. And uh, we, we, I have published this book um, and I have, I, I just looked, uh, um, it's among the best sellers now in, on, on um, Kindle. And um, it's just an analysis of the situation. Now we have to create the solutions. And uh, the next annual meeting of the World Economic Forum will be very much devoted to this great reset. And actually, the next annual meeting of the World Economic Forum will consist of two parts. One at the usual time in end of January, um, which will be a virtual, um, which will be a virtual nature. And during January, we will de define all the problems which the world has. It's a good moment at the beginning of the year with, uh, after the US elections and so on. Um, where do we stand? What is the state of the world? And then we will have a physical meeting, assuming that uh, vaccines are coming fast enough. We will have a physical meeting in May, where we will, um, in my opinion, it will be the most important meeting we ever had, because what we will do is uh, to, to look at all the system improvements which we have to undertake. Uh, so shaping a new social compact, uh, decarbonization, and I could go on and on, but not just raising the issue, but coming uh, up with very uh, pragmatic, action-oriented proposals. Thank you. So this, this, can I just pick you up very briefly on this, this distinction you're making between systems change and systems improvement and, and what it is, because they, we all use these terms and they can be a bit jargony. What is it that you're wanting to see and what is it you're not wanting to see um, in terms of that distinction? Again, what I want to, if we look at, um, at capitalism, let's put it, our system is based uh, on capitalism and uh, liberal democratic system. Uh, we don't want in any way to put into question the liberal uh, democratic system. But we have to change the notion of capitalism. Um, when, when you go back uh, to the origin of capitalism, it was actually an outcome of the first industrial revolution. So, um, in my opinion, it needs to be redefined in the age of the fourth industrial revolution. Now, for me, capital is not just financial capital, it's human capital, it's natural capital, it's societal capital. So when we talk about capitalism, what I uh, wish to see is that we embrace those different dimensions when, uh, when we talk about capitalism. And so we feel a responsibility to use all those categories of capital in the most responsible way. So um, I'm not, let's say, because today when you, when, you, when you say systems change, immediately I saw a, a one of the, of the lines of uh, uh, headlines, which I saw um, uh, referring to my book was, Klaus Schwab has become an ultra-Marxist. Um, <laughs> that's not the case. I'm believing in, in, in free enterprise, uh, in the entrepreneurial force, which you, which you represent, um, and not necessarily uh, uh, in, in, in government action. Governments are here to, to, to create the necessary regulatory system, 
So regulatory system can be to a certain extent directive. It can point into certain directions, but the core has to be uh, the entrepreneurial spirit, which we want to cultivate. Well, good. I'm glad we got our scoop from, for, the, for today's conversation that you've not become an ultra Marxist, uh, Klaus. Um, but um, I do think one of the distinctions is that, you know, to, to many people who feel excluded from the current system, uh, they really do want systems change. And I think many social entrepreneurs are in touch in a way with, with those people on a day to day basis. Whereas I guess many of the people that traditionally have attended the World Economic Forum probably see themselves as you know, in a sense, systems change is a very threatening idea, whereas systems improvement is, is less threatening. And I'm very struck that, you know, you have always been, you know, a radical in the sense of advocating stakeholder capitalism at a time when probably the shareholder Milton Friedman type capitalism was in the ascendancy. And so I'm intrigued to hear from you what sort of response you see from those that probably um, you know, we're quite, in some ways, quite content with the system as it was prior to this moment. Uh, are you seeing them rise to your challenge on the Great Reset? No, I, I, I would say um, that uh, in certain, in, not all, but in certain cases, I think uh, business leaders are even more ahead of the general discussion. I just take uh, the notion of, uh, you know, I'm I'm fighting since 50 years for uh, stakeholder capitalism, and it was not an easy fight because um, on the other side there was uh, a Nobel Prize winner, Milton Friedman, and um, uh, who gave a moral justification to uh, uh, shareholder capitalism because he said the business of business is business. And actually, exactly at the same time when I wrote my book on, on stakeholder capitalism. But um, uh, what, uh, why I'm so convinced that stakeholder capitalism is now getting ground uh, is the fact the Forum has um, a, a community which is called International Business Council. It comprises 120 of the top uh, business leaders in the world. And they are working now very hard to create a universally accepted system for the measurement of ESG, which means of environmental, uh, social, and good government's responsibility. And say in West hours, I, I, I can tell you last week, um, we had a meeting of the IBC. It lasted for a video conference, of course. It lasted for four hours. People going very much into details. And um, uh, what, what is interesting, uh, Matthew, now see the fight, uh, let's say, uh, against stakeholder capitalism is not so much coming from business leaders. Of course, there are still uh, a number of business leaders, but it's academics, it's uh, media leaders. And you may have followed my, my um, let's say, um, uh, discourse which I had with um, uh, one of the articles in Financial Times where I, uh, where I from, a, from more an academic, where I published afterwards a, a, a letter in Financial Times just reminding everybody that a business unit is not just an economic unit, but it's a social organism. I think we forget very often um, that companies are part of society and therefore are one of the cells in our so, uh, social system. And therefore they have not only, um, let's say, material responsibilities, but they have also responsibilities towards society um, and towards each of the stakeholders. Yeah, thank you. Hilda, can I, I turn to you? Um, how do you see the potential for social entrepreneurs and, and for Catalyst 2030 to play a role in this great reset? Um, I think there's a big role to play, a big role, because uh, social entrepreneurs are innovators. Um, they are looking ahead. 
and, and they are particularly confronted with uh, very in a very practical way with um, with daily problems and uh, so I think they should absolutely be uh, integrated into all aspects of the great reset because we have to start with many different kinds of uh, of, of, of things to to uh, to uh, restart it's uh, it, it's health um, it's uh, education it's agricultural development it's it's all these factors where you are working in your daily life and um, so and, and there is a lot of um, um, there are a lot of new innovations uh, with digitalizing uh, your work uh, everything what you have been doing already now can really help and that's why I mean we have to make sure that um, social entrepreneurs are listened to because I, I see your, you know, everything, all your recommendations, it goes in the same sense as our um, COVID-19 response, the, uh, the alliance we created and the action agenda. We are very complementary in what we ask from governments, from business leaders, from society. Uh, so we really have to make sure that the, we are not only listened to, but that action is followed followed thank you klaus um you know i think one of the themes of the catalyst 2030 report very much was you know that, that social entrepreneurs need to get a seat at the table and and, and particularly that whatever you want to call it social systems change or systems improvement requires co-creation it requires us to find a way that we can meld top down and bottom up in a way that i think the world though it's talked a lot about multi-stakeholder approaches hasn't yet figured out how to do what thoughts do you have about how we can better integrate the bottom up or the top down and and make sure that the, all the voices that need to be heard are getting heard so there's uh, a certain danger at this moment because um uh, it's very clear that um, in the crisis uh, in the pandemic uh, governments had to take a on a very uh, a much stronger role. So um, we have to make sure uh, um, that governments, let's say, prevent the system from a collapse at the moment. But when we want to improve the system, we have to make sure that we do not look just at governments, because um, uh, the world is so complex. Um, uh, I, I meet on a daily basis, I meet uh, now more virtually, I meet uh, public leaders and I'm always, uh, let's say, astonished uh, how, I wouldn't say superficial, but one-sided and sometimes we are, we are very theoretical, the understanding of issues is. Um, and um, here, I think the bottom-up um, uh, approach is absolutely necessary to come up with uh, actionable uh, solutions. Um, so that's the reason why, why uh, the, in, in the framework of the forum, uh, the social entrepreneurs play a particularly important role I would say together also with the, with the Global Shapers, our community of um, young leaders, we have 12,000 Global Shapers in our community because um, uh, in the past, uh, in the past, uh, let's say the older generation taught the young generation. Now uh, we have to look for solutions at the, at the bottom and that's you and we have to look uh, at solution at the front of thinking and that's the very young generation the global shapers and do you um do you think that uh, the opportunity in january of you know which you wouldn't have chosen but but is but but now to have a virtual world economic forum annual meeting does that offer the opportunity to use technology in a different way to bring more people in and, and give them a seat at the table, particularly the people that wouldn't normally have made the trip to Switzerland? 
Yeah, let me let me share with you our thinking, and um, we haven't even published yet. So you mm. you, uh, you are really at the source of uh, the newest um, uh, concept. The concept is the following: that in January uh, we have um, during the Davos week we look at the state of the world, and uh, we have the top global leaders. Um, to share uh, we, on a broad scale with everybody what is actually the situation. Where, where, where do we stand as a humankind? Uh, it's a start of the reset, if I may say so. And then um, in um, summer, uh, we will have a physical meeting in Switzerland, um, a special annual meeting like Davos, uh, bringing people together, provided, provided uh, we can um, take the responsibility for the health of the people. And I have to assume speaking, you know, um, the World Economic Forum is engaged in quite a number of um, initiatives, activities, also related to vaccines. So I would say there's a 60% probability that we are ready to do a physical meeting based on the vaccines, based on possible treatments, and based on, on um, fast testing. So you have the first pillar in, in um, January. You have a second physical pillar in, in summer. And the second pillar will be uh, very much related to solutions. Uh, what, what, how do we address all those issues? And in between uh, January and summer, we will have a number of task forces, um, multi-stakeholder task forces to work out those solutions. That's where we want to engage the, the, um, uh, the social entrepreneurs, uh, essentially in the elaboration of solutions. So it's actually, just to repeat, there are three phases. First, where do we stand? An assessment of the, of the uh, description of the challenges. Then we have a work process, uh, integrating um, all stakeholders. And then we have the final meeting um, where we discuss the proposed solutions. Great. I know that there are lots of social entrepreneurs who are you know, dying to be part of those uh, conversations. So we'll look forward to, we're, we're ready to be called upon. Um, so um, the, you mentioned the, the state of play on the vaccine. Um, and just before I go into the other questions that are coming in now from so many people, you are reasonably optimistic now that, that we will have a vaccine early, by early next year. Um, and if so, is that really just for a limited population? How do we how do we ensure that it gets to, to everybody as quickly as possible? I'm I'm sure that we have a vaccine, but I'm concerned about vaccine nationalism. Uh, as a vaccine has become a matter of national prestige. Uh, we see all kinds of announcements. Uh, we will have vaccine before the election in the states. We have already. Uh, I mean, we had our board meeting, board of trustees, and our Russian uh, member uh, was already vaccinated. Um, so, um, so is now this race. Now we know it's not just to have a vaccine and to have a vaccine which is uh, well tested, but to have uh, the protection facilities in place and to have the distribution facilities in place. And um, we are very concerned in the forum um, with a particular aspect of the, of the distribution, even if we, we work together with, with Gavi, um, uh, because you may have uh, quite a number of issues, even if you have enough vaccines, do you have to have a second dose? Um, uh, do you have to keep the vaccines um, uh, in, a, in a refrigerated uh, form? 
and so on and so on. So I think one of the big challenges next year uh, will be to fight um, vaccine uh, nationalism. Um, thank you. We have, we have a question from Maria Rubio, um, which is the, the economic situation is going to be an emergency for a long time. And there's a real question about how much government debt can grow. Um, and I guess in that situation, how worried are you that instead of getting the kind of stakeholder capitalism that we should get, that in fact there's a greater concentration in, uh, you know, the sort of profit-obsessed capitalism and uh, too much uh, money uh, staying away from the sectors where it's most needed? You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good question. How how can you engage uh, people into a fundamental discussion? about the future when they are suffering from an immediate crisis. And I'm, I'm very worried that we haven't seen yet the full effects of the economic consequences of this crisis. And even, even if we are able to, to come out um, um, uh, in a, let's say, in a not too catastrophic uh, way, uh, but at the end of the crisis, we will see the disparities even increase. I mean, if I look uh, at the statistics, we see now um, countries where let's see, estimate of GDP loss this year uh, goes down uh, to 10, 12 percent. I think 12 percent is the highest what I have seen. And then we have on the other side, we have um, countries which uh, do relatively well. Of course, China with even an economic growth, I think estimated at 0.3 percent this year. But this will increase the disparity because um, on a national level. So um, uh, take Brazil um, or some of the uh, Latin American countries losing up to 10% of GDP. Um, and then inside the country, you have um, uh, the people who, who um, let's say, uh, particularly those who have the assets, um, as you, you know, uh, you are more an expert with asset um, inflation. Um, uh, so wealth will increase and you have those on the other end um, where, um, uh, let's say, with the disposable income, if it's still available, will shrink. Um, so um, I'm very concerned and, um, and uh, I, I um, in my book, I, I, I think I gave a good analysis of the situation, but we do not have the answer yet. Um, just take, for example, long term, we, and, and the answers which we have, have an effect only longer term. We need a reform of our social contract, we need a reform of our tax systems, we need a reform of our educational system to give everybody uh, a fair chance uh, for uh, equality, but all those measures are effective only in the medium and long term. Yeah. Hilda, um, as you talk to social entrepreneurs, um, as they face up to the, the immediate challenge of COVID and also the Great Reset, what do you hear from them about what they most need in order to be able to have the impact that they potentially could have? Well, I think uh, they, well, uh, well, you should ask, you should ask them, you should not ask the ones who are here mm -hmm. now. But um, uh, what I think uh, is they, they really need people who, um, from government and uh, also companies, uh, other institutions who, who listen to them and who understand, who try to understand what they are going, what they are going through. Because many of them uh, have had to give up what the, their, uh, profession was like teaching or like you know providing health they have to feed the people in their uh, environment uh, and 
distribute milk, for instance. I mean, this, uh, because uh, the situation was so dire for, um, for all, the, uh, all the people they serve. So they couldn't even think of, of uh, you know, bringing children to school, but to give them something to, to eat. So it, it, that's, that was very, um, a very difficult situation. Uh, and it's not going away very soon. So I think also financing the social entrepreneurs needs a, maybe a different approach um, so that they can get uh, easier access to, to finance um, and so on. So that's probably uh, one of the most important things. Yes, I want to pick up on that point with you, Klaus. I mean, it does seem that one of the big challenges, and it was a challenge when I wrote about it in Philanthropy Capitalism, it's been a, a challenge over the years, is you know, there's lots of these, uh, lots of social entrepreneurs with, with great ideas um, that are making a difference on the ground, but getting a significant shift in how those ideas are financed and taken to scale seems to be a perennial problem. Um, um, what, what do we, what, what can we do to change the financing, uh, the way the world finances hey there. solving problems? I would, I would say we see some progress. I mean, impact investing, uh, has now become a, a very strong part uh, of uh, the financial system. Um, now, one of the issues is in impact investing is that um, the investors usually think uh, if they do impact investing on a relatively large scale and, um, and the social entrepreneurs are, are uh, working somewhere hidden in in Africa or wherever it is and may not get the attention. So we have to find mechanisms uh, to match, uh, let's say, uh, micro activities much more with available, uh, with available finance. One, just to add to, to what, you, uh, what you asked before, Hilde, um, one thing we have to look at and we have to work together, I, I, uh, many governments have now um, governmental programs to, to uh, support uh, medium-sized and small enterprises and social entrepreneurs, because they are individuals, are very often left out of the system. So we have to make sure uh, that um, uh, and we are, we are also working for that, that social entrepreneurs are integrated into those uh, government assistant programs. So we, you know, we're talking a lot about climate change, about circular economy, about sustainability. We've got a question from Luis uh, Canago. How do you see that we can accelerate the transition towards regenerative economics and the transfer of individual well-being driven approaches you know, to a collect, uh, focus on collective well-being and a more holistic approach? I think it's a, it's a question of mindset. It's not just a technical question where um, uh, you, of course you have uh, technical uh, means to accelerate like um, uh, the whole um, improvement of the system, like internalization of external costs uh, and so on, um, uh, carbon prices, which really correspond to the damage uh, carbon is doing. Um, but it goes beyond. I think it's, it's, a, it's change of our mindset. And um, I, Hilda and I, we, we, we called, uh, we had last week um, on Friday, we had a very interesting meeting. We, we, we put together uh, 20 of the best uh, philosophers uh, in the world and asked them what is actually the narrative? Because we need, a, we need a new societal narrative. If we do not have such a narrative, we always are stuck in, in technological responses uh, on a mini level. We don't solve the, the, the problem as such. So um, I, have to be, I have to be frank, we couldn't, 
we couldn't solve the question. Um, maybe the best, the best um, which we found is when we look at the narrative uh, for society of tomorrow. Um, if I go back to the first industrial revolution, um, uh, the ideologies like capitalism and socialism and so on were born. And actually before capitalism, um, no, and, and one of the consequences was that people started to define purpose of life in terms of um, what positions they have in the professional life and how they consume. I'm always amazed when I see um, uh, in the, what I told the sun sign, when I see um, um, when someone dies and you see the announcement, um, you see the profession uh, below, as if the profession would have been the most important thing uh, in, in life. So we, we, we define our lives based on, on, um, on still very much on the notion of production and consumption which is actually a derivative of, of, of the Industrial Revolution. And I think we have to go into a narrative of sharing and caring. As it was in, we can do it in the, in, even in the fourth Industrial Revolution, because we, we have now the production capabilities, um, um, we, which, which could be used to provide everything which, what he needs. But we have to come back to a, to a notion of sharing and caring. And if we do not change the mindset, um, if we still are focusing on the material side, we will not make substantial progress. And that's the reason why uh, in the work of the forum, I mentioned it before, for example, with the business leaders, we say, you should be measured not only in terms of your financial success, you have to be accountable also for uh, your performance in terms of um, environmental responsibility, social responsibility, good governments. But we need the same actually for governments. I think also governments, uh, we have to develop uh, a a framework for governments where we do not measure, where we go away from this uh, fixation on GDP. Um, and uh, I, I personally do not like the word happiness because happiness for me is something which is very much subjective, but well-being. So we have to measure much more well-being of a society and not just uh, the GDP. Uh, which a company or which a government or a country achieves. Um, Hilda, I, I, I think one of the one of the sort of most striking things about this pandemic and the impact it's had has been that women and other you know, people on, on the margins have been probably disproportionately impacted. Um, are there particular thoughts that you have about how we can prioritize helping them uh, in this moment? Yeah, well, that's a very, very difficult problem, but we, we, we have to do something. Um, it's very clear. Uh, and it cannot only be government. We, of course, we have seen a lot of uh, solidarity at the beginning of the pandemic. I'm not so sure if it holds for a very long time, but it was surprising how um, young people signed up to go grocery shopping for the olders and so on and so on. So we have seen that uh, even in the rich Geneva, um, a lot of solidarity uh, with these people. But we have to recognize that um, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, hidden suffering also. And somehow we should um, be able to detect that suffering and, 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 and help. Uh, these people, I, re I have no answer really. Um, of course, there are government programs and so on, but sometimes they don't find the people. As uh, Klaus had mentioned, it's the same thing on a very uh, micro uh, personal level. Um, 
so I, I really hope that the solidarity movement um, goes goes on a little bit, and uh, that if if we come out of this pandemic in one or two years, or maybe even later, that we can take something of the good, can take something over that uh, made us more human. Yeah, I think it's striking that after the two thousand eight. Uh, early nine crisis, there was a lot of focus on you know, restructuring the great you know, similar similar notions about how that was a crisis that mustn't be wasted. And yet, probably about eighteen months after the crisis, people at the top felt that things had got back to normal, and, and the energy around reform uh, went away. And I think this leads me partly, uh, Klaus, to a question that uh, Marco Kasich has, has, has posed, um, which I think is a question that lots of people outside of the forum community often ask about the forum. And he, he says, for the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Is it really possible to create real change for those at the bottom if we keep turning to leaders who caused many of the problems in the first place and who benefit most from the growing extreme income inequality and ever increasing concentration of power? And I suppose we're, 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 the question for you would be specifically, do you see something this time that makes you more optimistic that those leaders will be part of the solution than, than they have been at previous crises? I think um, when when you when you look, uh, let's say, at certain people, and you say, how can those people uh, change the system because they have excelled in greed in the past and so on? Uh, I would agree, but I would say uh, this is not the majority. The majority of of leaders I have to deal with. Um, um, are really uh, aware of um, the social responsibility. Let's not forget, say, first they are tied in. What do you do? What do you do if you are a business leader and you have a responsibility and you are under the pressure of a hedge fund, which um, um, uh, forces you uh, to produce short-term results? you can resign and then your successor will be even more uh, um, uh, compliant. Um, so I, I come up back, it's the system which also shapes uh, the behavior of people. So you have to integrate everybody. You have to integrate the, the present leaders um, uh, and uh, but you have to make sure that the other stakeholders, um, and that's the philosophy of the forum, that uh, social entrepreneurs, um, our NGO community, and so on, are integrated into the process of systems uh, improvement. So um, I'm, we have to give a voice to those who may be not sufficiently heard, who certainly are not sufficiently heard, but uh, you cannot deny that those who have responsibility today uh, are not, you, you, you cannot argue that those who have the responsibility today uh, should be completely excluded from uh, defining, this is unrealistic, uh, to define the system of tomorrow. And we have a question about uh, taxation and particularly taxation of the rich and a, a better taxation of business. Is reform of that tax system so that business and, and, and the wealthy are paying a, a bigger part of the cost of solving uh, some of these challenges? Is that something the forum supports? Yes, and I, uh, you saw it in my book. Um, I'm arguing for, for a change, but again, um, people are have a fixation or some people have a fixation on certain aspects of the tax system. I think that we, 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 we need not just, I'm, we in Geneva, you may be surprised, we in Geneva, we have a wealth tax. And, um, and uh, but it is the system as a whole. For example, we in Geneva, we have a wealth tax, which, which is quite high, uh, which has a, a redistribution effect. But we also have no capital gain tax, which means we have a relatively high income tax. People always feel uh, Switzerland is a tax haven, uh, but um, 
uh, our income tax is relatively high, so it's very progressive, uh, but we have no capital gain tax, which means um, it fosters very much entrepreneurial activity. But there are other elements of the tax system. For example, why not to internalize external costs? And we should probably move much more from taxing um, labor to taxing, uh, let's say, an irresponsible um, uh, environmental behavior. So to a much more green tax instead of a labor tax. So those are all, uh, let's say, elements of the great reset which we have to aim for. And um, it will be not, not easy because um, uh, for two reasons. First, people usually uh, concentrate and focus only on one dimension of the system. And second, of course, you have many entrenched uh, um, interests to maintain the status quo. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation, and I, I'm aware that there are so many questions we haven't been able to come to, and our hour is almost up. And I wanted to hand over to Jeru to, to, to ask a final question and to thank you. But um, Tracy Chambers also poses a question, which is, if for both of you, if you were a genie that had three wishes you could grant the world, what would they be? And maybe we'll just limit it to one wish each uh, before I hand back to Jeru. Uh, uh, Hilda, what would your one wish uh, be oh, uh, for, for us to prioritize? <laughs> and maybe for a wish for something to change this, this coming year, one, one thing you would like to see yeah, change. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, as, as I mentioned before, I think what I wish uh, would change uh, when we come back to more or less normal, we will not, never be come back to normal, but uh, I would really like to um, that people remember uh, how it was in March and in April, where the situation was very dire uh, throughout the world, in every country. And there was no, you know, no solution in sight. Everything was, was closed. And I wish that people remembered that moment, because that was something where you had to start thinking about the real values in life, what matters to you, uh, uh, how you would go about if, if uh, you were really in a very difficult situation. So that's what I wish for everyone. And Klaus? My wish is, uh, I was uh, very much uh, preoccupied uh, the last days or the last weekend uh, to define the, the values of the forum. And uh, of course, they represent also the values I try to strive for. And institutionally, uh, of course, we have the values of independence and impartiality and intellectual and moral um, integrity. But um, what values do we stand for? And I would, I would say uh, three values. Uh, the first one is truth. Uh, so values are truth, trust, and service. Truth, I think, in, in a world of fake news, we always have to see where is the truth. And sometimes we, we discover the truth only through dialogue. Uh, second, trust. Trust is, owned, earned, is only earned if you are trust, uh, if, you, if you cultivate trust, trustworthiness, trustworthiness. And, um, uh, so, um, um, the last one is a service. How, and, and I put it in a very simple way, um, how do we give out more than we take in? It's, in some way, the personal life is different, uh, or our, uh, our personal action, and I think you social entrepreneurs, you are the best example. In a company, you, you flourish, if you take in much more than you get, than you give out. As an individual, I think you create your legacy. If you are capable uh, to give much more out than you take in. Now, what is my wish? My wish is that we could penetrate with those three values, uh, political and economic and social decision making. Great. Well, um I'm going to hand down to Jeru to give a final word, but I'd like to thank you both for, for your uh, time and your insight and your support for social entrepreneurs. Um, 
And I'd like to thank Francois Bonici for, for setting this, this, this up and for all the great work he's doing also with the Schwab Foundation. Giroud, uh, it seems only fitting that you have the last word here. You're, you're on mute though. Typically me, sorry. Thank you, Matthew, for facilitating this fireside chat. Once again, a big thank you to Francois and, uh, for making this happen and for the whole Schwab Foundation team for getting everything going. And more importantly, I have to tell you, Klaus and Hilda, Francois and the team have been fantastically supportive, not just to Catalyst, but to all entrepreneurs. So I would like to thank them. And last but not the least, thank you, thank you, thank you. You've been amazing. Uh, so many private messages have come saying both of you have been super fantastic for us. And this means a lot to Catalyst. That means a lot to social entrepreneurs across the world. And thanks for all your support. What can I say? If I were there, like always, I would give both of you a big hug. So I'm giving a big hug. To big hug. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Jeru. You get a big, you. Big hug. a big kiss. And thank you, Matthew. Thank, thank you, you Francois. Good to see you. I, I would, I would, uh, uh, I would like, well, that's another wish that we could continue for an hour. It's a fascinating discussion. And uh, so a great uh, thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. And thank we are you. there to support you in the great reset. All the entrepreneurs here. So just call on us. Thank you for thank that. You. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.